I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. I have no idea if we're being heard on shortwave WWCR tonight, for as it was coming up to the top of the hour to begin our broadcast, I didn't hear any station break, I didn't hear any cue. What I heard was not the normal broadcast that usually precedes the hour of the time. I have no idea what they're doing in Nashville, Tennessee with this broadcast. And uh, after last uh, Friday night, it doesn't surprise me a bit. Apparently, they either have some new personnel or, uh, well, I just don't know, ladies and gentlemen. But I guarantee you, tomorrow, I'm going to have the manager of that station on the telephone, and I'm going to find out. Because if this continues, they're not going to get their next paycheck. And uh, that's the way it is, moving west. Well, a significant breaking story here is a member of the Tri-States Militia who apparently held a high degree of trust and was placed in command of the Militia Communications Center in South Dakota was being paid $1,775 a month by the Federal Bureau of Investigation as an FBI informant. Now, the man's name is John Parsons. That's John Parsons, tri-state militia member, based in Burke, South Dakota. He has uh, been revealed in testimony in a trial in Oklahoma, the trial of Willie Ray Lampley, as an FBI paid informant. Now, I've warned you people so many times. I told you. I told you on this broadcast that there was a tremendous operation underway to infiltrate the militias, to control the militias, to pay people to inform on the militias. And it doesn't appear to me like you're listening <coughs> at all. And this is just one of many all over the place. You're not performing background checks. Somebody talks a good talk. You give them a high rank and put them in a position of trust. And I got to tell you right now, you're exhibiting the signs of gross, and I mean gross, stupidity. Guaranteed you're going to lose the war. And uh, when things like this happen, you deserve it, in my estimation. It's like you're playing some little cowboy and Indian game in the backyard. It's as if you don't understand the stakes. You think you can trust people? I'm telling you right now, you can't trust anybody, not even your own mother. And you'd better understand that. You are raid against the most powerful propaganda machine in the world. You are arrayed against the highest level of technology ever developed upon this planet. You are arrayed against an oligarchy of wealthy individuals who want to bring the world under socialism in order to enslave the common man. and concentrate the wealth of the world in their hands. You are arrayed against the most powerful military forces and weapons that the world has ever known. You are arrayed against people who, if they don't have the brains to come up with plans and techniques with which to outsmart you and enslave you, they have the money to pay those who do have the brains to come up with those plans and ideas and techniques. And you still run around with your little cap pistols. Bang, bang, you're dead. Can I be the Indian today? Oh, I want to be the cowboy. 
Sorry, guys. You missed the boat. And you're going to lose the war before it ever starts. And it's one of the reasons I've been trying to make sure that it never has to start. You cannot. And you will not. Prevail against this enemy. When you exhibit such a marked degree of absolute and utter ignorance and stupidity. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear a tape that was made on April the 26th, 1995. Exactly seven days after the Oklahoma City bombing. The tape is uh, by Dennis Leap. Dennis Leap of the Philadelphia Church of God, which is a branch of the Worldwide Church of God under a man named Armstrong, who recently died. You're going to hear a lot of criticism of two books. One is Behold a Pale Horse, written by William Cooper, yours truly. Another one, The New World Order, written by Gary Cobb. And the reason that you're going to be hearing this criticism of these two books will become evident to you as you listen to this man confirm everything that Gary Kaw and William Cooper told you in those two books and that I've been telling you ever since this broadcast first aired on May the 2nd, excuse me, May the 4th, 1992. You will hear him admit that there's going to be a space invasion, and he claims it's going to be led by Jesus Christ, who is a space alien. He admits that they are bringing a world government. Oh, he admits a lot of things. He admits that man is going to become God. He admits that this is all a part of British Israelism, which is one of the biggest scams on the face of this earth. Some of you who agree with this man are going to love it. Some of you who don't like me will love his criticism of me and my book. But those of you who have brains are going to see the verification and vindication of everything that I've ever been telling you, that Gary Kaw told you in his book and many others. Most people would never air this tape because of the criticism directed at the host of this broadcast. Rush Limbaugh would never do it. G. Gordon Liddy would never do it. In fact, I don't know any other radio personality in this world who would air a tape that was so critical of the host of the broadcast. But I'm going to do it because we're only interested in the truth here. If you agree with the criticism, that's fine. But if you're smart, you'll listen to the revelations that are made by the man speaking, Mr. Dennis Leap, the Worldwide Church of God, the Philadelphia branch, about the coming New World Order and the way things are going to be. It is terrifying. Literally terrifying. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you are strapped in your seat. Make sure that you take notes. And if you belong to the Worldwide Church of God or were thinking of joining, you'd better think again. In fact, You'd better go on a worldwide search for your brain and find out what happened to you. How did you get trapped by these despicable Luciferian proponents of the mystery religion charlatans? If you look out at our society, President, there are many thinking people, or I should say many thinking people can see that there is something terribly wrong in our world. Now, even the many that do think, maybe I could qualify that, I'm trying to be a better qualifier of things I say, but even the many that are thinking, there's still few versus the majority of people out there. <laughs> I mean, there are some thinking people out there, but even if you look at the whole mass of humanity, most of the masses are still caught up in 
the cares of this life, as Jesus Christ called it. I mean, they have their entertainment, they have their jobs and their occupations and their families, and they're really not uh, you know, watching what's happening. But there are a few out there that see there are a lot of troubles in our world, and they're very upset about it, and they want some solutions. But do we realize, brethren, that even those few that are thinking can't come to a right solution? I mean, and I'm talking about people outside this church. I'm talking about people outside this ministry. You know that people are upset, some very talented people, and they see things that happen like the bombing in Oklahoma City. And they, they look for an answer. They struggle for an answer. They look for a solution, and they can't figure it out. And then by comparison with all the many people in this world, there's only a very relatively few people who can really understand these things and understand why a tragedy happens. And only a few people can come to a right solution. And that is you, and that is me, and do we understand how unique we are. There are many books out there today, and you can go into a, in any bookstore. You can go into either a religious bookstore, or you can go into a secular bookstore, and you're going to see many books today warning about the coming destruction of the United States of America. And in this, they are right. I mean, there is a coming destruction of the United States of America. This country is falling apart. But, but brethren, do you realize, you know, that these books, even of themselves, still don't have the right solution? And even though they amass a lot of facts, the facts that they have don't really add up right. And there's really there's two very popular books that have floated around the Philadelphia Church of God. One is called The Old of Hell Horse by William Cooper. And I have copies of them here if you'd like to come up and look at them. Uh, this has been circulated around the, the, the church. And uh, I think there are pockets of people that probably read it more than others. But uh, in my travels, I have uh, come across that book. And even uh, uh, I first became aware of that book, and uh, I think it was when it first came out. Let me just remember the year here when it did come out so that I don't... Uh, I think I first heard of it in 1992 when I was in Atlanta, 1992. There's another book out there called En Route to Global Occupation, and it's by Mr. Gary H. Kong. And uh, these men are very sincere men. Uh, brethren, I, I, I think we need to understand that they're very sincere. Uh, they do have a lot of facts, and uh, you know, some of the facts are amazing. Uh, but how much weight... If you think about it, how much weight should we in God's church give these books? How much weight should we give these books? And some people, I think, in the church, to a fault, have given them too much weight. And, um, you know, so I think we're seeing some of the results of that problem. So tonight, for the Bible study, what I want to do is I want to give you a biblical outlook on books such as Behold a Pale Horse, and in Roots of Global Occupation. And, and again, I really believe it is a biblical view. Uh, let me give you a disclaimer on the Bible study. You know, I, I like to give disclaimers now. I'm giving them more often. But let me say what the Bible study is not. This is not, you know, an attempt to mind control. <laughs> it's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to uh, control your mind. This is no attempt to dictate to you what you read. Uh, that's not my intention at all, to dictate you what you read. It's not my attempt, nor do I desire to put you down, personally, if you have uh, gotten heavily involved in these books. It's not my in intention to put you down. Neither is my intention to put down Mr. Cooper. Neither is my intention to put down Mr. Ka. Uh, brethren, that's not my job. But we do have to, brethren, instruct you. That's in the ministry it says there. We have to instruct you. We have to edify you. But it is my purpose tonight to help you come to a righteous judgment. I mean, you do have to make judgments about certain things. You do have to make judgments about what you allow into your mind. We just spent a whole Holy Day season, and there was more than one minister talking to their congregations about guarding our minds and guarding our thinking. And we have to do that. Let's look at John 7 and verse 24 to begin. John 7 and verse 24 you and I are going to share a rule of the universe with Jesus Christ, and you and I are going to be given an awful lot of, or let's say, an incredible power 
And uh, to the degree that we can make judgments, I believe, is the, the degree that Jesus Christ and God the Father can rely on us to make wise judgments or righteous judgments. And we have to have a good sense of judgment. I think what Christ said in John 7 and verse 24. Uh, if you look at um, this whole chapter, he was being judged by healing uh, on the Sabbath day. And of course, uh, you know, people do look at leadership and people look at people. And I mean, people in leadership. And sometimes we develop this, I think even in the United States alone, and maybe my view of NASA, sometimes we get this romantic view of our leadership and we, we want to have people tell us what we want to hear. But here's what Jesus Christ said, John 7, verse 24, says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And like I said, these men have done a lot of research. They've amassed a lot of facts, but the facts don't necessarily add up the way they say they should. You know, so, uh, you know, we could uh, look at the appearance, but there is a deeper view, there's a deeper thing or deeper opinion we need to come to. And, of course, you know, we should make righteous judgment. I mean, we should judge certain leaders. We've had to do that with the ministry in the Philadelphia Church. I mean, that's really one of the main thrusts of our work. And it tells us that in Malachi 3, 16 through 18, it tells us that we have to judge or we have to discern, you know, who's, who's righteous and who's wicked. I mean, that's, that's the whole goal of the Philadelphia Church is to bring people back in a right relationship with God and with Jesus Christ and with the ministry. And so we do have to make some righteous judgments. Let's look at, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. <clears throat> Here's a scripture that we sometimes only read one part of. I, mean, I did cover this with you uh, in my Holy Day message from the Days of Unleavened Bread. But I think it's something we need to think about, and I'm thinking about it more and more. And I just think we need to apply it more and more. You see, brethren, we are in God's Philadelphia Church, aren't we? We all have access to God's Holy Spirit. We, as it says in Corinthians, have the mind of Christ. So we should be able to sit down in a reasonable fashion, <laughs> you know, with, with not a lot of arguing and not a lot of yelling and not a lot of heckling or any heckling, really, whatsoever. And we should be able to come to the same mind and judgment about certain books. And we should be able to come to the same mind and certain, same judgment on certain issues that affect your life and my life and all of our lives together. First Corinthians 1 and verse 10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Now there's a time when this really comes into play, and many times we'll, we have our people out there, and uh, they'll hear something on the tape, and if they don't understand it, or if they have a question about it, what we want them to do is, instead of spreading questions or misunderstanding through a group, we want them to call the man that gave the tape. Or call the man that gave the sermon. Or call headquarters. <laughs> and if you don't understand it, you, know, you speak the same thing by keeping your mouth shut. And that, that's the way it goes. We have too much strife in our little groups because some people have gotten in there and they use these groups as a forum for their opinions. You know, and we should be letting God, God guide our mind and our opinions. He says that there should be no divisions among you. But then how much should we hate division? I mean, we should hate division with a passion in this church. I mean, we have been all subject to division. Why are you here and why am I here? Well, we're here because, you know, some Laodicean thinks changed God's doctrine and created a division. You know, we're not the, we're not the people dividing. We're the people standing up for the truth. But there are some people that are out to divide, and there are some people out there that just want to, you know, have a following, and that's not us. But it says there, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see, if you don't understand something, you just you know you speak what you do understand. But then later, you shouldn't just hold your breath. <laughs> you know, that's where some people make a mistake. Well, they say, well, look, we have to speak the same thing. Therefore, I'm going to believe what I want to believe, and I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. But if there are issues out there, if there are doubts in your mind, why don't you come in? Why don't we sit down and we try and come to the same mind and the same judgment? I mean, aren't we all striving for unity? And I mean, we, we can have a hypocritical unity and all sit in here and smile and look like we're all together. And I think we've been shown over the holidays that you know, what's in our mind is what's most important. So we do have to come to a right judgment. And I can remember years ago, 
Uh, one of the things was preaching and saying, look, at it. I mean, if you don't accept the fact that Mr. Armstrong is Elijah in your mind, and if you have one disagreement with any of his doctrines, you're not going to place the station. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter what you do on the outside. You know, it's what's going on on the inside that's important. See, eventually, if you have a mental disagreement with anything in the Philadelphia Church, eventually it's going to come out. It has to. It has to. It's all going to come out in the wash. So, let's look at these books now. And again, <coughs> please remember the disclaimer. And if you forgot the disclaimer, when you get the tape, listen to the disclaimer again. One thing that we can say honestly about men like Bill Cooper and about Bill Carr or, or Gary Carr, excuse me, and I think I wouldn't be surprised if he even went to England. You could probably find these kind of books, you know, with the title UK on it instead of, you know, uh, you know, United States. And you could go find these books. I'm sure if you went into Germany, you could find books. I'm sure you went into New Zealand, you could find books. You know, so really, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, the country really doesn't matter. The one thing, brethren, I think we can say, honestly, about all these men, they are end-time event prognosticators. I mean, they are trying to talk about end-time events. They're talking about destruction, right? They're talking about destruction of society. They're talking about, you know, destruction of the United States. They're talking about destruction of the United Kingdom. You know, they are talking about end-time events. And we are told, you know, how to be careful. I mean, these people do have a religious sense. I'm going to show you that very clearly. And we've been warned about people that come to us with a religious type message. Let's look at Second John 2 and verse 6. Second John 2 and verse 6. <clears throat> it says there, and this is the love that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in. And so we are to walk after Jesus Christ's commandments and God the Father's commandments. I mean, that's, that's the theme. And of course, the first four commandments had to do with loving God. And the second six had to do with loving each other. And it includes the Sabbath and the Holy Days and the statutes and the judgments. And we can go on and on and on. But there is enough record. I mean, uh, there's enough paper record, written record, what the Philadelphia Church stands for. Verse 7 is a warning. It says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. We did run an article uh, not too long ago, I think in either the Trumpet or the Philadelphia News, about what this verse meant. If you haven't read that, pick it up and uh, you know, look, at, look for it again. But Jesus Christ you know, has come in the flesh. We do preach the family of God. And also, I was just preached the other day that Jesus Christ has come in your flesh. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. You have His mind in you. And that's what makes us family. He says, look, not to your, or look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we have received a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. I mean, it's very clear that. I mean, it, it, we have a whole church out there that is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. And it says they have not God. I mean, they are alienated from God. And he that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. I mean, we do have a detailed doctrine. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a unified doctrine. And we believe very much in the family of God. And we believe we're going to be God as much as God is God. God the Father will always be the Father. Christ will always be the firstborn Son. We will always be the wife. Mr. Armstrong has taught that year by year by year. And we still teach that. And so we have to understand what, what this church is all about. And now look at verse 10. It says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. And so when you're reading a book, ladies and gentlemen and brethren, I mean, when you read a book, I mean, do you understand or do you look for an underlying religious philosophy? <laughs> and I think if you really look into the New World Order, and you understand who's writing the books on the New World Order, you would look at them you know, more skeptically than you have maybe in the past. These people are coming to you with a religious orientation, but yet they're not bringing my doctrine. You know, I don't hear them talking about the family of God. I don't you know, to hear them talking about being born into the family of God at the first resurrection. You know, they may talk Sabbath, but I don't hear them talking Holy Days. You know, I don't hear them talking about the United States of Britain in, in prophecy in the detail that we do. Or they may know about British Israelism. 
you know, so we have to we have to be careful how we, we how we view these these men. Let me just read to you some of the philosophy of these men to show you that they do have a they they do have a religious philosophy. I mean, they they are, and I think you'll be able to clearly see they are end time event prognosticators. They even use the words prophets and then with a message. You know, so that should make us right there say, hey, do I want to spend twenty five dollars on this book? <laughs> you know, do I want to invest twenty five dollars in this book? Here's the introduction to the book, and it's signed by Barbara Ann. Now I don't know who Barbara Ann is. I'm not. I don't know if Barbara Ann is. I don't know if Ann is her last name. Or I don't know if it's a middle name. I don't know who she is. It really, really never, never, never defines it. But here's how they set this book up. It says there are many who do not want you to. There are many who do not want you to know what Bill has to say. They have tried many times to stop him from saying it. The scars on his face and the loss of his legs are his badges of sincerity on your behalf. And again, I do believe Mr. Cooper is sincere. It says no one becomes popular by telling the people the truth. And again, I think you'd agree with that. That's a true statement. It says, but history records what happened to the true prophets of the past. And so here she begins to, to build a religious overtone to the book. She even refers to him and compares him like a true prophet of the past. It says, however, some have listened to their warnings and were not caught off guard. Others have put their heads in the sand and refused to listen. Here's what she says now about Bill. Bill has it together and has put it together for you so you can also be one of the informed of the world. A well-informed person can make the right decision. William Cooper has my vote of approval because I've cared enough to find out who the man is. Now this is your opportunity. So even in the introduction, she begins to compare him as a prophet of the past. And here's what Bill says about himself. This is on page two. If you want to follow along, if you have the book, you can follow along right with it. Here's in the first paragraph. He says, it is a series. It is this series. This is what the end of the first paragraph. It is this series of incidents that have convinced me that God has had a hand in my life. I do not believe in fate. I do not believe in accidents. And so he, he begins to, to build a conclusion that, that really God was working directly in his life to bring things to his attention, to bring things to certain points so that he could then write this book to save you. I mean, that's, that is the underlying message of the book. It's right there. He says, I cannot and will not accept the theory that long sequences of unrelated accidents determine world events. It is inconceivable that those with power and wealth would not band together with a common bond, common interest, and a long-range plan to decide and direct the future of the world. So he, he does not believe in coincidences, and he, he believes that there's, there has not been coincidences in his life. He says, here's, here's what he also says. <coughs> he says, I believe... And this is what he says about himself. I believe with all my heart that God put me in places. This is page three, by the way. We also like to follow along. So I believe with all my heart that God put me in places and in positions throughout my life so that I would be able to deliver this warning to his people. I mean, that's, that's how he sums up his book. This is God, and he uses capital his. You know, so he's saying this is God's warning to his people and I pray that I have been worthy, that I have done my job. You know, I mean, brethren, to, to me, in my mind, in my thinking, and again, uh, I think I have looked at this book maybe a little more objectively than some others, but I believe this man, I mean, if you understand what we teach about our work and being the Ezekiel Watson work, right? Don't you think this man is putting himself on a par with Mr. Bill Fleur? I believe he is. I believe he is. He said, this is my creed. He said, I first, and he said, I believe first in God, the same God in which my ancestors believed. I believe in Jesus Christ, that he is my Savior. Second, I believe in the Constitution of the Republic of the United States without interpretation as it was written and meant to work. Now, that's, that's his philosophy. He's entitled to that philosophy. He said, I have given my sacred oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And if you begin to put that in light, with some of the things that have happened recently. Brethren, I think you're going to, and I can read some things later in the book, I, I think you can begin to see where someone like Mr. Cooper can incite things that maybe he doesn't even plan on inciting. He says, I intend to fulfill that oath. Third, in other words, he's going to defend the United States Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And one thing that I think is upsetting about books like this, you know, is, is somehow they believe that the United States' greatness was caused by the Constitution. 
Now, what caused the United States' greatness? I mean, you have to go back to the United States and Britain and prophecy. I mean, the Constitution didn't give us greatness. What gave us greatness? Go back to U.S. and B.C. and prophecy, and it says there very clearly that we didn't become great as a nation until the 1800s, and that's because we, you know, came in contact with the Louisiana purpose. How long was the Constitution already in effect? I mean, God is the one that's made this country great, and really, it goes back to the obedience of Abraham, doesn't it? That's what made us great. He said, Third, I believe in the family unit, in particular my family unit. I have sworn that I will give my life if it is required in defense of God and the Constitution. And, um, I mean, in defense of, in defense of God, and then I didn't... Uh, Steve, this is page uh, three and four. It says, third, I believe in the family unit, and in particular my family unit. I have sworn that I will give my life as, if it is required in defense of God, the constitution of my family. Fourth, I believe that any man without principles, that, that he is ready and willing to die for at any given moment, is already dead and is of no use or consequence whatsoever. So you can begin to think that man, you know, is he setting the example or is he setting the standard on principles? You know, and then that's pages three and four. Okay, that's what Mr. Cooper thinks. Okay. Um, well, let me see. Page six. I've got to read this. I'm getting ahead of my notes. He says on page six, he says, I am a man with a message. This is the top of the page. He says, and the message will be accepted by only a few. To those of you who understand I am your brother, maybe we can change the future for the better. I mean, isn't that similar to what we say? <laughs> and we have a message, so I'm going to be accepted by a few. You know, and uh, you know, I talked about bringing this doctrine. And, uh, you know, if you look at page 30, and I'll just show it to you. He talks about his wife and his daughter. And she's a beautiful woman. And he has a lovely little daughter. And they're on the picture with a Christmas tree. So, I mean, is he bringing this doctrine with him? You know, I think, I think you'd have to begin to say, um, you know, we should, like I said, look at, some of these things skeptically. And here's what Mr. Ka says related to himself. This is on page 24 of En Route to Global Occupation. If I can find this. He says um, Mr. Ka was supposedly in a governmental office. I have no reason to doubt him. There's no way I could necessarily prove it. Or I should say this way, nor did I take the time to try and prove it. But he's talking about a series of events that happened to him when he was working. He says, that night I did get much sleep. I kept wondering what all this meant and how it might affect my future. Why, of all people, did this man share this information with me? Was this meeting just another coincidence, or was God trying to get my attention? And he says this throughout the book. He says, uh, soon after returning to the States, I began what turned out to be a time-consuming investigation of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, Commission and Related Organizations, all the while continuing to gather information on global financial matters. During that same year, I would also discover there was a spiritual side to all of this. And it says he discovered it. Soon I was spending most of my free time investigating what I loosely referred to as one world movement. The research was exhausting, but I felt driven to do it. Inside of me, I knew that this was what God wanted me to do. And he's claiming, uh, you know, that, that, that he has God on his side. Let me just show you some... Other things, this is page 67. He says, the amazing thing about all of this, and he, he's talking about the, the New Age movement here, he says, the amazing thing about all of this was my experience in dealing with the new currency, the global societies, and the New Age movement, all took place within an eight-month period. It took these three experiences to knock me out of my complacency. I believe this was God's way of getting my attention. My life has never been the same since. I was now prepared to do some serious investigation. He goes on to page 8. He said, uh, After nearly two years of studying the New Age, I felt that I had a grasp of the movement and its inner workings, and I believed that I had accomplished my purpose in this area. I did not want to dwell on the New Age writings any more than I had to. The material was so dark and oppressive that I always felt way down after reading it. I believed God had called me to expose the movement. Otherwise, I would have stopped researching it much earlier. See, he felt God has called him to expose a movement. Now, brethren, we, we've been taught over the years when people say they're working for God or they have a message from God or they have a mission from God, 
and they're not of this church or they're not of this ministry, what do we do about them? You know, aren't we we're very careful, we should be very careful about what we read and what we accept. He says, I do not recommend that anyone do this type of research unless they are absolutely certain it is God's will for them. <laughs> but then they should offset anything they read by reading the Bible at least the same amount of time. But, but he believes God has uh, put him on a mission. He believes God has, has uh, given him a job to do. So I think that's enough. Uh, but if you go back and you, you read the underlying view of some of these men, uh, you'll see that they are uh, Protestant in nature, sometimes evangelical Protestant in nature, and a lot of the books on the New World Order are being written by evangelical Protestants. And evangelical Protestants teach and do a lot of things that you and I would never consider doing. And so we need to, to look at their books with a certain amount of skepticism. Brethren, I think sometimes we forget how truly we unique we are as a body and as a church, and that we, you know we have so many wonderful things at our disposal. And sometimes I think because it all sounds like 007 stuff, <laughs> you know, or secret agent stuff, that somehow it seems more exciting. It seems more exciting. But, but only God can really guide us in the true understanding. And that's the point. I mean, only God can guide us in the true understanding. And God isn't guiding these people. He's just not guiding these people. Um, that they're really the underlying philosophy or the underlying um, message to this New World Order movement is that there is a contest between God and Satan. There is this idea that there's a contest between God and Satan now, what does God think about that? I mean, you and I, I know what God thinks about that. Mr. Armstrong told us for years that there was never any contest between God and Satan. And if you think about it, what they're trying to do is they're trying to save a world that God isn't even interested in saving. <laughs> is, God, is God interested in saving this world? He's not, is he? And, and that's what we're going to learn on the day of Pentecost, aren't we? It's only some six weeks away. And we're going to learn that God isn't trying to save this world now. God has written this world off. And that's where a lot of us have to come to an understanding. Let me just read you what Gary Koss says about this whole thing in Roots of Global Occupation and why we need to read his book. He said, um, you know, he's talking about Satan's fury. And he said, uh, Satan's fury, on the other hand, will be experienced by those who do not take the mark or bow to worship him. And, uh, you know, and, and that he's right. Of course, he believes in the rapture. So this persecution will be in the form of imprisonment, torture, or death. Christians, however, should draw comfort from the fact that Satan's persecution is limited to this world. In other words, you see, they're going to be off somewhere. Maybe they're going to be on the moon. I mean, <laughs> they don't know where they're going to be, right? And it says, God's principal judgment against the wicked for last of all eternity. He said, this ongoing battle is part of the spiritual warfare being waged between God and Satan over our souls. And it explains why those who are doing the most for God are often the ones who suffer most. And so, I mean, that, that's the whole um, thing behind this, the, the New World Movement. Let me just tell you what, uh, what Mr. Cooper wants. I mean, he, he says it right in the front of his piece. He said, look, he says, the ideas and conclusions expressed in this work are mine alone. It is possible that one or more conclusions may be wrong. The purpose of this book is to convince you, the reader, that something is terribly wrong. It is my hope that this work will inspire you to begin an earnest search for the truth. Your conclusions may be different, but together maybe we can build a better world. You know, I mean, that, that's the point, brethren. How, how do we build a better world? Well, you know, we have to look forward to the world tomorrow. Let's look at Hebrews 2 and verse 5. Hebrews 2 and verse 5. There is no contest between God and Satan. This is already Satan's world. And that's what men like Gary Kahn and Bill, men like Bill Cooper can understand. They, they, they deal, both of them deal heavily with the evils of Freemasonry and the evils of the, the Illuminati. And they believe that the Freemasons are behind the New World Movement. I'm sure there are some people out there that believe this whole bombing in Oklahoma City was CIA-inspired or it was Illuminati-inspired, or it was Freemason-inspired. 
And that's what, that's what they're going to believe. And they believe that Satan is working, you know, through Freemasonry to bring this one world government all apart, all about. And they don't understand that the Roman Catholic Church and traditional Protestantism is still Satan's, and Satan's church anyway. And they don't understand that. See, they think it's a pretty good world out there. They think what they're doing is pretty good. I mean, they think they're working for God. They think all these ministers are out there working for God. But, but they don't understand Satan's wicked twist that they're all working for Satan. <laughs> Except for one church. And one group of people. But Hebrews 2 and 5, I mean, here's, here's what we're looking for. It says, For the angel, for unto the angels have ye not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. See, the angels, you know, the angels have this earth. You know, Satan the devil was the prince of this earth. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I think sometimes we forget this. I mean, this can seem so basic to us. The brethren of God, do we see how astounding this knowledge is? I mean, just think if Gary Kaw had that information that Satan is already in charge. Satan already is inspiring all the other churches out there except ours. I mean, Satan is in charge of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is an evil. I mean, they do worship Satan the devil. But so does the Pope. So does the minister around the corner. They don't know it. But that's who's in charge. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to break in here because we may have some new listeners who do not understand the philosophy of the mystery school. The reason that he can say that all of the churches and all of the ministers and all other religions are all worshiping Satan is because the mysteries believe that the God of the Bible, the God that you worship in your church on Sunday as a Christian, is really Satan, and that Lucifer is the true God who set man free from the bonds of ignorance in the Garden of Eden by giving him the gift of knowledge. You are listening to the voice of Luciferianism. You are listening to the voice of the Mystery School. You are listening to the voice of the New World Order. If you listen carefully, or if you have listened carefully, you heard him say, and he said, we, we will be God just as God. He said that earlier in this broadcast. You're going to hear more revelations. And what you don't hear tonight, I will finish this broadcast, or this tape, I should say, on tomorrow night. And uh, judging from what I can hear on my shortwave radio, this is one of those nights when you're hearing something so extraordinary and so important that we're being jammed out of existence at least here in the state of Arizona. And folks, it's not propagation that I'm hearing on the short wave. It's jamming. And I've heard it many times before in the military. See, what is our gospel all about? Our gospel is all about that, you know, Satan and the angels blew it, and God still is going to see this whole universe made beautiful, you know, with a creation, and God has to now use His family to do it. And, you know, that's what we're all about. That's what the gospel's all about. And, and you know, some people want to say, well, the Philadelphia church has lost the gospel. Well, that's so much hogwash. I mean, why are we out there warning and warning and warning? We're out there warning God's people. We're out there warning the United States. We're out there warning Britain and the rest of this world because there is some tragic events. But, brethren, what's most tragic of all is some of our dearly beloved brethren are going to give up their positions in the family of God and they're never going to have an opportunity to see this universe created properly. That's what's tragic. I mean, see, all the people in the United States that, that never heard the gospel, that never had an opportunity to hear what we hear, they still have a chance. But our lay esteem brethren, and I think the evidence is there, how many of them were truly converted. I mean, many of them were truly converted. They're ready to cash it all in forever. And that's what's incredibly tragic. I mean, you know, review those scriptures. Revelation twelve nine. What does it say about Satan the devil? It says that he has deceived the whole world. He's deceived the whole world. And what does, what does Mr. Armstrong say about a deceived person? Well, unfortunately, they don't know they're deceived. 
<laughs> and that's why, like I said, that's why men like Mr. Cooper and Mr. Kaw, I mean, they, they believe they're right. But they're deceived. They're deceived. You know, they are deceived. You know, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, you know, you know what does it say? It says it's, you know, that, that if you're disobedient to the commandments, if you're disobedient to the holy days, you know, if you're disobedient to the statutes and the judgments and the laws of God, then you know, who's working in their lives? It says it's Satan the devil. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3 says that. Let's, let's look at Galatians 1 and verse 4. I remember showing this scripture to someone you know, a long time ago, and uh, you know, they were asking me about the church, and they were asking me about certain things, and I, I said, well, you know, this whole world needs to be changed. It's so wretched. And they said, well, this is a good world. I said, it is? And they said, well, look at all the good in this world. But, but what does Paul call it? And it says in verse 4 there, it says, who gave himself for our sins, and he might deliver us from this present evil world. <laughs> I mean, our world is evil. You know, and I am so thankful that I am an American. I'm thankful that I've had the opportunity to live in America. I think it's, it's obvious that, that, you know, because of the Constitution, we can have a work like our work go out from America. I mean, that, there is that bonus there. And, and that, but we do have certain constitutional rights that way that you can't find in other countries, not even any, in some of the other Eastern countries, countries, you can't find that freedom. But the look at what our freedoms have given us given us pornography and abortion. And somehow some people believe if you could just get back to this pure constitution, well, brethren, when is the constitution pure? <laughs> and it's still part of Satan's whole government structure. It's not God's government. And there is, there is some confusion in that. Some of, the, some of the things in the constitution were based on the Magna Carta. Some of the Magna Carta is based on the Ten Commandments. But, but why isn't it all the Ten Commandments? <laughs> it's just not. And we know that's not going to happen until Jesus Christ returns. You know, but, but uh, this is the present evil world. And what these men want to do is they want to save something that should be stopped. They want to save something that should be stopped. Anyway. And it's going to take Jesus Christ to stop it righteously. And that's what we're waiting for. You know, you know, the Philadelphia Church does not teach overthrow the government. We don't teach that. You know, we're not even teaching the overthrowing the worldwide church of God, I understand, you know, through rumor that there's this group that wants to take over the college and they want to take over the, you know, the campuses and they want to take over the church. That's not what we teach. You know, we're not in rebellion against God's government. They, they want to say, well, look, you know, David never rebelled against Saul. Yeah, but David wouldn't walk with Saul either. <laughs> I mean, why did David have a band of men with him? And because they, they did not follow Saul in his disobedience, and that's really what we are. We're not, you know, we're not following Saul in his disobedience. We're not following, you know, the wrong men. But we, we're not overthrowing the church either. We're just saying, okay, we're on the outside, and if you want to band with the truth, then you're going to band with us. You know, if, if you look at what these men want to do, you know, I mean, their view of, of how to deal with, you know, trying to preserve, let me just read what they want. I mean, they want to preserve things the way they are. And brethren, who would ever, <laughs> who would ever want to preserve this mess? It's a mess. And it says, um, here's, here's their... Um, Here's their frustration with the New World Order. It says that if the New World Order, for example, were to be based on a two- or three-party system, all the New Age occultists would have to do is control each of these parties, something easily accomplished since they were the ones responsible for proposing world government in the first place. These insiders would determine the temporal change and the rest of the world would follow their lead. Sovereign nations would cease to exist. <laughs> Guess what's coming? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, what are we saying? I mean, brethren of God, do you realize that, that once our message is really understood by men like Gary Kaw, that we're going to be just lumped in with the rest of it? You know what we teach? What do we teach? We teach one world government, don't we? <laughs> we teach that's the only solution 
to all of the problems. If sovereign nations would cease to exist, a single global economic system would be established, and anything left from the old order of things would be purely superficial, such as languages, cultures, names of countries, etc. Any, any real authority would now rest with an international body controlled by Satan himself. And, of course, we know the beast power is coming. But, but if you begin to, to think about what's happening, you know, brethren, we do teach one world government under Jesus Christ, and I think before it's all over and Jesus Christ returns, I mean, why do people look, uh, you know, look after him? Or, or why do people fight against Jesus Christ? Well, well some of these men teach that, that there's this underlying plot to, um, you, know, you know, kind of uh, deceive the whole world to think that there's these spaceships out there and these flying saucers. You know, it's like that's what they're trying to do to unite this world. And here Jesus Christ is going to return from outer space and they're going to fight him. Do you think maybe they have deceived the world to believe? You know, that Jesus Christ is some being from outer space, <laughs> which he is, from the third heaven. But, but these people want to save sovereign nations, and these people want to save sovereign governments, and, and you know, that, isn't that the cause of all the trouble? Isn't that the cause of all the division? Where men can't get together in peace? You know, and even Jesus Christ tells us, in Christ, there's no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female. I mean, we've, the, the, the separateness is going to end. Here's what, here's what um, Bill Cooper wants. And, and again, this is very, very, very tragic. But um, and here, here's what he says, and what he recommends. And this is on page 160 of Behold a Pale Horse. Now, it's not clear, and this much I'll give Mr. Cooper, it's not clear whether he's quoting something or this is what he advocates, but, but certainly he printed it in his book. So I would think he advocates it. And, and uh, we need to send him our editing team, because it starts with a quote and you never find the rest of the quote. <laughs> you know, so you don't know where the quote marks begin or end. But it's also interesting, this is a, a test case in Oklahoma, and it says Oklahoma and it's... Uh, a law number 1750, the police state has case. It says, Gary North recently wrote about one of the scariest pieces of socialistic police state legislation to arrive on the scene to date. Now, a lot of these people that are in the militias and in the patriot movement and some of these men like, like um, Bill Cooper, and he really is different than Gary Kaw, but, but they are frustrated with this, on, you know, this seem, seemingly unadvancing police state, but when they bomb the building in Oklahoma City, what are they causing? They're causing a police state to start. <laughs> that they're, they're uh, you know, that they're just causing their own trouble. You'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Mr. Dennis Leap just accused Gary Carr and I, William Cooper, of bombing the Muro Federal Building in Oklahoma City. This is an incredible exercise in the most unbelievable propaganda that I think you're ever going to hear, and I hope that you're listening carefully, because tomorrow night we're going to finish this tape. You're going to hear it all. He's already said that Jesus Christ is an alien, that he's going to come from outer space, just as me and others have been warning you, and that's what all this UFO baloney is all about. You're going to be amazed at the revelations that you hear from the mouth of Dennis Leap speaking for the Worldwide Church of God, the Philadelphia branch, the Philadelphia Church of God. And he's admitted that they're working for a world government, that it's the only solution. And he said, this is an evil world. <laughs> And, uh, but he says there's no battle between God and Satan because he believes that the God of the Bible, uh, but he quotes from the Bible, and they all do, because they are experts in the art of propaganda. He believes, as do all of the mysteries, that the God that you worship as a Christian every Sunday, or whenever you go to church, is really Satan. And that Lucifer is really God. And it's the same thing that Tom Valentine said in his interview conducted by 
Richard Noon in the book 5-5-2000. And, uh, well, folks, if you've listened to our series on the mysteries, you know. If you haven't, you need to. And if you're a new listener, you're probably baffled out of your mind and don't know what in the world is going on. In that case, I would suggest that you write and get a copy of our tape list and get yourself up to speed. Good night, folks. Don't miss tomorrow night. And God bless you all. You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm Pooh. And I'm William Cooper. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, folks, I had one broadcast to do tonight, but since WWCR has once again failed us, and we are not on WWCR, and I'm looking into other shortwave uh, transmitting stations to broadcast on because I've had it up to my ears with WWCR and their shenanigans, I believe that they have purposely turned the signal strength down on this broadcast on many occasions uh, because the broadcast before and the broadcast right after came in strong and clear all over the country and all over the world. And uh, I don't know what they're doing tonight or why they're doing it, but we are not on WWCR. I can guarantee you I'll find out tomorrow for sure. In the meantime, if you know a shortwave broadcast station that is looking for the number one shortwave show in the world, it's available as of right now. Not taking any more crap from WWCR. Period. I already have a uh, an offer from a another station down in the southeast United States that is extremely attractive and would actually allow us to not only broadcast with them, but maybe on one or two others because of the price. And it's a prime time slot, which would be earlier. So, since WWCR chooses not to air us for some reason, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, do the second half of the tape of the Worldwide Church of God Bible study that many of you found so interesting. So, stay tuned, because here it comes. As soon as it... They're just causing their own trouble. There you go. He goes on to say, on January 1st, 1991, a new 96-page state law goes into effect, and it requires all Oklahoma residents to declare everything they own to the tax collector, everything, guns, coins, art collections, furniture, business equipment, bank accounts, household furniture, etc. Forms will be distributed through banks. Uh, any tax payer, payer who refuses to fill out the form and submit to the tax assessor by March 15th, and, and he has listed in there the eyes of March, he, he's against the Illuminati, he's against, you know, Romanism, you know, and, and they want to always, you know, draw this association, you know, back to the Illuminati and back to the Freemasonry and back to all these things. So he will ask permission to enter the home or place of business. If the request is denied, he will be issued a search warrant. Any property not previously listed or undervalued will be assessed a penalty of up to 20% of its market value. This will make renters into property taxes and make life easy for the gun grabbers. He says, what are the investment implications of this? He says, invest in a good gun and be standing on your porch with a gun in hand when they pay you a visit. And that's what he's advocating. And, and, and brethren, we don't advocate violence in this church. You know, Jesus Christ said, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And I talked with Mr. Floyd today, and he's, he certainly wanted me to say this. You know, if, if any of our members out there, you know, are on these militia lists or patriot lists, if you're receiving information from these people, you know, you may want to consider getting your name off these lists because could you, in some way, be implicating the Philadelphia Church? I mean... I think this bombing in Oklahoma City was so tragic, it's going it, to, I think the government is now going to go after all these people. And they're going to look into your background. And I worked for the, the Department of Energy, you know, for 14 years of my life. And I know they did a nine month investigation on me. The FBI has done it. They're very thorough. They know every address I ever had. They know every telephone number. I'm sure they can go in and find out about anything they wanted to about me. And they can find out anything they want to about you. 
This is what are the investment implications? Oh, I already read that. And he goes on to say down here, well, they get away with this blatant disregard for civil and constitutional rights. And again, you know, brethren of God, you know, I don't think I need to get into this argument. I don't think you need to get into this argument. And that's not what I'm trying to do. And I'm sure there are a hundred people out there that will want to debate me on whether this is constitutional or not constitutional. And, uh, you know, what does Jesus Christ say about that? Well, you read Second Timothy 2. You read from about 14 through 16. He says, look, let's stop this endless debate to, to no profit. And what's really going to profit us? He goes on to say, well, they get away with this blatant disregard for civil and constitutional rights. That is exactly the reason for the law to find out if it will meet with strong or violent opposition. Now, now I've never been asked to do this. I mean, I've been living in the state for almost three years. I've, I've never been given the form and asked to do it. It says, um, if the citizens of Oklahoma lie down and allow this to happen, then you can bet everyone else in the nation is going to be subject to the same or similar law. It's time to stand up with a weapon and scream enough. And that's what he's advocating. It is time to draw the line. It is time to make decisions and carry them out. It is time to resist at any and all cost. The penalty for failing to do so is slavery. You know, is it not time for rebellion? Is it not time for restoration? The Constitution must be again, as it once was, the supreme law of the land. Federalism is treason. Stand up and fight. I mean, that's what he says right here. And you can, like I said, you can come up and, and read the book yourself. Like I said, he begins the quote at the beginning, but there's no quote towards the end, so it's a little, uh, you know, hard to say, uh, you know, where he's beginning to quote and where he doesn't quote. I mean, uh, we've got to be careful, brethren. We've got to be careful, brethren of God. And I would hate, I mean, that the government and, uh, you know, the, the people in this society are going to come after us. But let's not invite them. I mean, they're going to come after us. Mr. Corey preached that years ago. Already in, in the book of the Amos, he's written it there. And probably the governor's going to come in and say, "Look, we can't bear any more of your words. Let's get out of here." And so what? Let's speed the day and let's get out of here. Yeah, but we're not going to we're not going to stand up and fight them. <laughs> yeah. I think I told people if they come after me with you know with handcuffs, here, take me. You know, let's get this over with. Let's get this. I just wanted to show you on this. Uh, it's interesting on this page uh, 69. <coughs> he warns, as Gary Paul warns about what groups to watch out for. <laughs> Let me tell you, here's the group we're supposed to watch out for. It says, It's amazing that man has fallen for these deceptive teachings. And he, he talks about pantheism. He says, His pantheism is clearly based on the two oldest lies of Satan, the same lies that tripped up Adam and Eve. He says, The serpent lured the first couple into sin. By promising them that they ate of the forbidden fruit, they would never die and they would become like God. You know, I mean, that, that wasn't all a lie. <laughs> you know, they couldn't live forever if they ate the fruit, right? But they could become like God. And that's what we teach. I hope you all caught that, ladies and gentlemen. They couldn't live forever. But they could become like God. And that's what we teach. That's exactly what they teach. So all when he's quoting the Bible and talking about Jesus and the words of, of Jesus and the words of God, he's mocking you. He's mocking the Bible. He's mocking Christianity. For their God is Lucifer. And that phrase, that sentence that he just made, just then, exposes it all as did the first side of the tape that I played on a previous broadcast, and as will the rest of this tape. Expose them as what they are. And, and that's what he warns against. And, you know, and, and like I said, we're going to be lumped in as a New Age group, and of course they've already been called a call and every other unsavory thing. And so there's going to be a lot more unsavory things to come. But Mr. Corey warned us, and he warned us, even on a tape recently, um, you know, I'm just going to read from his article on Jonah that's coming out in the Philadelphia Trumpet. And he talks here in the article on Jonah and gave him a sermon that we have vowed a vow to God. We owe God something. And we went under the waters of baptism. I mean, we did pledge loyalty to God and to Christ. We pledged loyalty to a message. And I think we also pledged loyalty to each other. Loyalty to each other. And we have to protect each other. And we need to be careful who we associate with um, so that we're not drawn into unnecessary uh, controversy. 
He goes, Mr. Corey writes, have we forgotten that vow? Have we forgotten that salvation is at stake? Either we deliver God's message or we die for all eternity. Satan is always trying to pull us away from what we vow to God. And that's what so many of our people forget. I mean, they forget what we're about. We are about a new world a government. We're about Christ taking over the reins of this government. We're about putting Satan away forever. We're about becoming God. You know, we're, we're about looking for a new world. Now, for those of you who may just be tuning in and don't understand all of this, remember what happened in the Bible in the Garden of Eden. God said they were not supposed to eat of the tree of knowledge. And they did. And they did because Satan came along, actually Satan acting on behalf of Lucifer, came along and told Adam and Eve that God had lied to them, that they would not surely die and they would become as gods. And so in the mystery religion, those who really worship Lucifer as God and call the God of the Bible, your God, Satan, believe that Lucifer set man free with the gift of the knowledge of good and evil through his agent Satan and that through the use of this knowledge, man himself will become God. Remember, he said that if they failed to worship their God, they would surely die, and if they worshiped their God properly, they would live forever? That's the promise of Satan, that they would not die. And he just got through saying that they would become gods. I'm going to rewind this a little bit so that you'll understand how easily it is to deceive people. Because I guarantee you, the people who belong to that church and listen to these people have no idea what they're being taught. It just sounds good. It sounds real nice. And their parents probably took them there years ago because most people go to the church that their parents took them to. That just happens to be a natural fact. And I think we also pledge loyalty to each other, loyalty to each other, and we have to protect each other. And we need to be careful who we associate with um, so that we're not drawn into unnecessary uh, controversy. He goes, Mr. Corey writes, have we forgotten that vow? Have we forgotten that salvation is at stake? Either we deliver God's message or we die for all eternity. Satan is always trying to pull us away from what we vow to God. And that's what so many of our people forget. I mean, they forget what we're about. We are about a new world, a government. We're about Christ taking over the reins of this government. We're about putting Satan away forever. We're about becoming God. You know, we're, we're about looking for a new world. And see, Satan is always trying to track us away from this. So the tiny few have been sidetracked from the TCG by extreme interest in such philosophies as the New World Order. And again, Mr. Floyd is talking about extreme interest. I mean, I have to admit it's been interesting for me to read these books. It's been interesting. And uh, you know, someone told me that they spent hours and hours reading books and in some ways, that's, I mean, they're entitled to that if they want to do that, but I don't have hours and hours <laughs> to be involved in these books. And, and to be honest, you know, so much of them are unprovable. And they talk about that the AIDS virus has been, you know, it's, it's kind of been started by a CIA plot. You know, and this is a CIA plot, and that's a CIA plot. And even Mr. Cooper says, well, I have this information for you, but I can't divulge the source. Well, then why read it? I mean, I'll, I'll, I can just quote that for you here. I mean, and I don't. I mean, I want you to believe me. <laughs> no, I don't want you to take my word for it. Here's page 196. I mean, and he goes into a lot of depth about, you know, the UFOs and, and uh, you know, how the, this, uh, the Illuminati and the Freemasonry and this New World Order have built these fantastic machines to deceive the people. Now, if you can build a machine that fantastic, why do you have to worry about deceiving anybody? Just take them over, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what I feel about it. Why, why all this, this uh, deceptive campaign? The many sources of information were used to research this chapter. I originally wrote this piece as a research paper. It was first delivered at the MUFON Symposium on July 2nd, 1989 in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
Most of the knowledge comes directly from or as a result of my own research into the top secret magic material, which I, M-A-J-I-C, I should say, material, which I saw and read between the years of 1970 and 73 as a member of the intelligence briefing team of the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Since some of the information was derived from sources I cannot divulge for obvious reasons and from public sources which I cannot vouch for, this chapter must be turned to hypothesis. That's one of the largest chapters in the book. You know, and so, so that's when I say, brethren of God, why are we wasting our time with this? When we have so many other things, you know, that we should be reading and could be reading. I mean, it's, it, he even says it's hypothesis, but there are, I know there are some very sincere people out there, and again, Mr. Corey said there are a tiny few, but there are a tiny few out there that, that have put more stock in that than our own message. And that's pathetic. And that's very sad. We've got to come to the conclusion, brethren, and ask this question. I mean, and if someone came up to you and asked you, why is this nation going down, can you give them the Bible answer? There is a Bible answer. You know, why is this nation going down? Let's look at Isaiah 46 and verse 9. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. And these are scriptures that we should be reminding ourselves of over and over again. If you want to know why this nation is going down, what source do you go to? It says, remember, remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Says, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. And so, I mean, how do we really come to an understanding of end time events? I mean, what's the right focus? Well, we've got to look to God and Christ to give it to us. I mean, God says, look, I'm calling the end from the beginning. God knows the end. And he is involved, heavily involved, and he uh, gets involved, brethren, and, and he makes sure the events work out the way he intends them to work out. We don't need to go to men like Gary Kong. We don't need to go to men like Gary Cooper, or Bill Cooper, I should say. Gary Cooper was an actor that's dead a long time ago. I'm sorry. I get confused with my names. But you see, God can guide us through this, this whole maze, and really, if you look at it, God's message is so simple. I mean, if, if you go in there and you try and start proving all these things, it's almost unprovable. Almost unprovable. But God's message is, is very simple. And I read that to you on the Holy Day, 2 Corinthians 11.3. You know, Paul says, Look, I fear for you people, and I fear, I fear that you're going to be taken away from the simplicity of Christ. And that's what God fears. And that's what I fear. I mean, that's what the ministry fears for people. I mean, our, our message is so simple. See, our message is so simple, it may not be as scintillating. <laughs> But, but honestly, if, if you would try and go out and prove these books and prove them and prove them and prove them, it would take you a long time. And maybe you could be out there proving and the rest of us are going to be gone. I mean, that's my own speculation. <laughs> I mean, we've got to be careful of these things. But, but why is this nation going down? Well, God tells us why it's going down. You know, let's just go to the scripture I, I just was looking at the other day. And I didn't plan to use this tonight, but let's use this. And just to come back to some basic understanding. Revelation 1. I mean, God the Father loves you, and He's concerned about you, and He loves me, and He's concerned about me. You know, and, and God the Father is going to tell us certain things. He's going to reveal to us certain things. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, Revelation 1 and verse 1. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. You know, God is going to show us what's going to come to pass. And there isn't anything in the Bible, brethren. I mean, there is no... I mean, God gives us details. He kind of gives us gigantic events. And I believe that Freemasonry and the Illuminati was as important as these people think that God would have told us so. And God doesn't tell us so. You know, 
someone asked me, well, where does the Illuminati and all that fit in? Well, I believe it still fits in under, you know, the Babylon mystery, the great, the great horror. I mean, this is all part of that great horror system. But it's not, a, it's not better than that horror system or bigger than the horror system. That's what they want to say. They want to say, well, this, this is all encompassing. This is bigger than the Catholic Church. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible says. You see, God does love us, and He's going to give us things. He says He's going to show us, you know, what comes to pass. You know, and, and who's He going to show it through? He's going to show it through Jesus Christ. So Christ is going to give us the right emphasis. Christ is going to give us the right focus. And there are things that are going to happen in this country that we have to face certain realities. Let's look at Matthew 24 and verse 4. Kind of take a little bit of a different path. Matthew 24 and verse 4. And you see, people out there look for reasons you know, why these things are happening. Like I said, unfortunately, they're looking for stability and security and something they can't give them, stability and security. And the, the, this Constitution can't give us stability and security. You know, the monarchy in Britain can't give us stability and security. It can't. But, but this is what we're facing. Like I said, Christ is going to give us the right emphasis. You know, what, 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 Christ, what does Christ ask us, to, ask us to focus on? I mean, He gives us a focus that's a pretty simple focus. Uh, Matthew 24 and verse 4, Jesus said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Number one thing we're to watch out for in our lives in the Philadelphia Church of God is deceit. We've got to be careful of deceit. We've got to be wary of deceit. It says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 6 says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, so you should be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So for nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. I mean, we're seeing famines and pestilences, and there's wars, you know, and, and uh, of course, Mr. Armstrong taught us verse 7 means world war. We have to look out for world war. But let's answer that question now. I mean, using Jesus Christ, and, and uh, you know, if you look at Matthew 4 and verse 8, Jesus Christ said, look, you know, uh, there's going to be pestilences and famines and there's going to be all these troubles. And, and you know, he says, he tells us it's coming. God says, look, I'm going, to, I'm going to help my servants. I'm going to show them what's coming. I'm going to use Christ to reveal it. And now we can ask the, ask the question or answer the question, why is this nation going down? You know, why is this nation going down? Well, the, the answer is, brethren, because God is taking it down. That's why this nation is going down. Let's look at Ephesians 6, I mean, excuse me, Ezekiel 6 and verse 10. I mean, this is what this nation needs to hear. I mean, what, what, ne what, what message does this nation need to hear? I mean, what message? And Mr. Cooper says he's a man with a message. Gary Koss says he's a man with a message. But what message does this world need to hear? Do they need to you know, be put in fear of Freemasonry? <laughs> do, they, do they need to be put in fear of the Illuminati? Do they need to be put in fear of the Council on Foreign Relations? Do they need to be you know, put in fear of the Trilateral Commission? Well, they need to be put in, you know, uh, back in the right relationship in the fear of God. That's what they need. You know, Ezekiel 6 and verse 10 says, And they shall know that I am the Eternal, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. See, why is this nation going down? Because they are Manasseh. They are the tribe of, of the tribe of Joseph, and they have violated the covenant. Ladies and gentlemen, that is straight out of British Israelism, which is a crock of crap. And they're going to be punished. They're going to be punished severely. Thus says the Eternal God, smite with your hand, stamp with your foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. See, that's what God is saying. Look, I'm against them. You know, there's so much history in World War I and history in World War II where this country was spared, you know, a lot of war on our soil. I mean, there were, you know, there were some Japanese bombs that, that went off in the Pacific and there were, you know, um, 
and, and that's in Hawaii. It was, you know, it was bombed by the Japanese, but for, for the most part, you know, besides the Civil War and the, and the Revolutionary War, I mean, you know, uh, you know, there hasn't really been that much conflict on this nation, but that conflict is coming. And why is it coming? I mean, Jesus Christ warned us there's going to be trouble. You know, the beginning of sorrow is his ear, brethren. It's really here. I mean, we're having a lot of sorrow and sorrow and sorrow. But he says, look, I'm against you. I'm doing this evil. You know, and, and you know, how it comes about in the long run, the little minor details, really doesn't matter, does it? But there are some people, I believe, you know, that, that will give more power to the Illuminati or more power to the CIA than to God. And God says, he's bringing this nation down. Let's look at Ezekiel 13. Ezekiel 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, And the word of the Eternal came unto me, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear you the word of the Eternal. You see, we've got a message for Gary Cobb. We've got a message for Bill Cooper. I mean, they have taken the name, title, and they've taken the, 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 the phrase prophet on themselves, Ladies and gentlemen, that is a blatant, barefaced, and clear-cut lie. Nowhere in my book, nowhere in my entire life, have I ever called myself a prophet or used the term prophet. Indeed, I have made it a point to tell everyone who's ever listened to me that I am not a prophet. God does not whisper in my ear. All I have is a message for the American people to wake up or they're going to be enslaved. So this man has now made himself a liar. Listen to the rest of it. He's, he's lied so many times, it's pathetic. He says that the Bible, God says, that he's going to bring this nation down. And nowhere in the Bible, anywhere, does it say anything about this nation or that it's coming down. And will they listen to our words? You know, because they're choosing what they're going to do. I mean, they're choosing what they're going to do. Verse 8, it says, Therefore, says the eternal God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, says the eternal God. I am against you. And that's the message. I mean, I, I don't see anybody out there really saying, well, look, all these things are happening because God is against us because we're sinning against God. I think it's a pretty good world. You know, they believe once saved, always saved. And they're going to have to grovel in the ruins, um, you know, of their own sin. Let's look at Jeremiah 30, verse 14. I mean, that's, that's the truth, brethren. That's our message. That is our message. That's what we have to deliver. That's what we have to get caught up in. That's what we have to get excited about. That's what we have to support. You know, the United States has made all these pacts, and they've made all these politics, they, you know, they've made all these uh, love arrangements, and look what's going to happen. It says, all your lovers have forgotten you. They seek you for naught, for I have wounded you. You see, God has wounded us. God is going to wound us, I should say. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquity, because your sins were increased. See, why are we being taxed more? And why are free, certain freedoms being taken away? It's because we're sinning more. <laughs> That's why it's all happening. You know, God is against us, brethren. God is against us. God is against us. God is against us. And the reason why we're in so much trouble is because of our sin both as a nation and as individuals of the nation. And then we just had that wonderful sermon, you know, where you know, where they talk about the Assyrians and you know, and the only nation in history that was truly repented before God. Will this nation repent? I mean I pray it will. And that's the only solution. <laughs> I'm not getting a gun and fighting your IRS agent. 
you know, that's not, that's not going to stop all this tragedy. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And again, I'm not trying to make fun of anyone. I mean, well, I'm just saying, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Let's go to Ezekiel 5 and verse 1. Ezekiel 5 and verse 1. <clears throat> You see, here's what's coming on this nation. And there, there's a tragic message here, but there's also a message hope for, of hope for you and I. Ezekiel 5 and verse 1, it says, And you, son of man, take you a sharp knife, take you a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon your head and upon your beard. Then take you three balances to weigh and divide the hair. You shall burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city. I mean, that's coming on this nation. It says, when the days of the siege are fulfilled, and you shall take a third part and smite it about with a knife. And the third part you shall scatter in the wind, and I will draw a sword out after them. You shall also take therefore a few in number, and bind them in your skirts. See, the message is so simple. You know, what we're going to see, brethren, in this beginning of sorrows, or as Christ talked of the famines and the pestilences, you know, and, and the wars, you know, we're going to see... And so many people killed in this country. You know, and it says that we flee. You know, uh, you know, just just when the the tribulation, you know, it's like when, when they're ready to start massacring God's lay of the scenes, we're gone. But up to that time, it says that we can see many, many horrible things. You know, the bombing in Oklahoma City is going to look like kids. Really, like child's play. Before this is all over. But look at the promise there in verse 3. It says, Some are going to be taken and, and hidden in the skirts. Hidden in, in the skirts. Verse 12. It says, The third part of you shall die with a pestilence, with famine. Shall they be consumed in the midst of you? And a third part shall fall by the sword round about you. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds. And I will draw a sword out after them. You know, so if you think about it, you know, we're, we're going to see, you know, you just begin to divide up the thirds and, and, you know, just begin to count cities by thirds and you're going to see people, you know, die of the pestilence and die of the, you know, the famines and, and uh, you know, if you think about it, even, even a famine, I mean, brother, what would it take if, you know, if there was a massive earthquake, this is my own speculation, what if there was a massive, massive earthquake, you know, uh, on the west coast it kind of devastated all the trucking industry and maybe there were some other real serious problems on the east coast you know if you could knock out just a few cities you could cripple this country in terms of food you know and I know for myself you know there's a part of me that says okay let's go out and buy some land but if I had to feed myself I'd be dead in a few weeks anyway <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know so, so I'm stuck on my trucking industry but um but again, brethren, we just have to, to face, you know, some serious things are coming. Where, where did you learn about those thirds? And how have you learned about those thirds? How have you learned about what's coming? Well, you've learned it through Mr. Armstrong, and now you're, you know, you're reliving it or relearning it through, you know, the, the Philadelphia Church. And so it's, it's our message and it's our booklets that are the ones that are truly exciting. That's what's exciting. It's so simple. We don't need a master's degree. We don't need a Ph.D. We don't have to go to Washington, D.C. and try and dig up every CIA record to find out what's happening. We just don't have to do that. You know, even Matthew 24, 15, when it tells us what to look for next, it says the abomination of desolation, right? And that's what we're all looking for, aren't we? And then right after that, we're looking for, you know, the, the tribulation and the martyrdom of the saints. You know, we're... You know, and, and uh, hopefully none of us are going to see that. Hopefully we're going to be in a place of safety. But see, that's what it tells us to look for. It says the abomination of desolation. Where do you find out about the abomination? Well, you've got to go to Daniel 7. You've got to go to Daniel 11. You've got to go to Revelation 13. And where did you learn that? You know, you learned it from Mr. Armstrong. The book of Revelation unveiled at last. You know, you, you look in the Middle East in prophecy. You look in who is the beast. And that's where we have to go to find out those things. That's what you have to understand. You know, it doesn't matter, really, in the long run, you know, what Freemasonry does. It doesn't matter what the Illuminati does. It doesn't matter what the Council on Foreign Relations does. It doesn't matter what the Tribunal Commission does. It doesn't matter. You know, this, even this Gary Kahn, in his book, you can turn there yourself, 
You know, he, he says that the ten kings, you know, these ten economic blocks that are supposedly set up by the New World Order, the United States is one of them. He says we're part of the beast. You know, I mean, so, so but, you know, let's not be ridiculous. I mean, he, they've got a map in here, and it shows these maps. And uh, you know, so he said these are the ten kings. And also, you know, he talks about the Antichrist, and he says the way we prove the Antichrist is to go to Daniel 7. In the 70 weeks prophecy. Well, that's about Jesus Christ, not about the Antichrist. He says the beast is going to be in power for the three and a half weeks here, and then he's going to be cut off, and there's another three and a half weeks. You've never heard that before in your life. You know, and, and someone said, well, yeah, we, we know that's all wrong. You just call all that off. I said, well, if you call all that off, what's left? And it's, it's not worth, to me, it's not worth the effort to try and figure out what you can use and what you can't use. When we have all these other books, you know, that, that, that we should be really reading and studying. I mean, there's literature after, I mean, look at, We've got Malachi's message, we've got Isaiah, we've got Ezekiel, we've got Jeremiah, we've got, you know, the new book that's coming out, God as a Family, we've got Zephaniah. got so much to look at and so much to study and so much to understand. I know one of the things in preparation for this Bible study, I got it out of an old booklet. I mean, uh, it's called Ninth. I mean, he, they've got a map in here and it shows these maps and uh, you know, so he said these are the ten kings. He also you know, he talks about the Antichrist, and he says the way we prove the Antichrist is to go to Daniel 7. In the 70 weeks prophecy. <laughs> That's about Jesus Christ, not about the Antichrist. He says the beast is going to be in power for the three and a half weeks here, and then he's going to be cut off, and there's another three and a half weeks. You've never heard that before in your life. You know, and, and someone said, well, yeah, we, we know that's all wrong. You just call all that off. I said, well, if you call all that off, what's left? And it's, it's not worth, to me, it's not worth the effort to try and figure out what you can use and what you can't use. When we have all these other books, you know, that, that, that we should be really reading and studying. I mean, there's literature after it. I mean, look at, we've got Malachi's message. We've got Isaiah. We have Ezekiel. We have Jeremiah. We've got, you know, the new book that's coming out. God as a family. We've got Zephaniah. And we've got so much to look at and so much to study and so much to understand. I know one of the things in preparation for this Bible study, I got it out of an old booklet. I mean, uh, it's called 1975 in Prophecy. And um, you know, I, I took it along on the airplane just as a, a kind of, well, I'm, I'm, I have never read this. And uh, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is really interesting. Well, I, I found it was really fascinating. Because I came into church, I was baptized in June 1975. And this was written in 1956, and I just want to read to you, brethren, how up-to-date this book still is. Now, there's parts of it that aren't up-to-date. And there's parts that aren't up-to-date. But, but why don't we spend time with this booklet? And some of Mr. Armstrong's other booklet. Why don't we spend time with Mystery of the Ages and the Incredible Human Potential? You know, why don't we spend time with folks like The Wonderful World Tomorrow? I mean, th those are the only books you can depend on. Here's what Mr. Armstrong wrote. I'll start on page five, and, and this is incredible. Incredible. You know, he, he warned about, the, you know, communism and the psychological Cold War, and in some ways, you know, I guess you could almost put the Illuminati in the, con you know, the, you could kind of lump them all into that. I mean, these men do see our society being, um, from, you know, from the underpinnings, they see our people being, you know, led into all this entertainment. Well, that's true. But, but communism started that. And Mr. Armstrong saw that years ago. He says, undercover in Europe, he says, while America has been focus focusing its attention, sole attention 
on its clumsily effort to meet psychological Cold War with antiquated diplomacy and military might, the real number one enemy has been perfecting its plan secretly undercover in Europe. Mr. Flory has even written about you know, that the, the Germany rises out of the abyss and you can't see it. You know, it's, it's always working undercover. So these plans were laid by Adolf Hitler during World War II. The methodological Germans took into consideration the possibility they might lose even as they had lost World War I. This time their plans for coming back and launching World War III were carefully laid before the close of World War II. When Mr. Armstrong wrote this in 1956, he says that the day that war ended, the Nazi organization went underground. You can go to the Bible and prove that. You can go to your Bible and prove Do you hear that, folks? You can go to your Bible and prove that the Nazis went underground at the end of World War II. <laughs> ah, it gets better. It gets much better. Since so their plans for coming back have been proceeding undercover since 1945. Already Nazis are in many key positions in German industry, in German education, and in the new German army. In World War I, the Kaiser allied with Austria, sought to conquer France, Britain, and America. American industry finally beat him. In World War II, Hitler tried to conquer the world, first by taking Austria and the student land, through diplomatic gangsterism, then second with, a, with lightning quick war, taking Poland, Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, and France, and third, while holding these nations by the throat with his Gestapo, and allied with his junior partner Mussolini to conquer Russia on the east and Britain on the west. But again, American industry and three acts of God at Dunkirk, El Alamein, and the destruction of the German hydrogen bomb plant at Penyumund defeated Hitler. But this time the Nazi plan to sidestep the causes of past defeats. Excuse me, but, but this time the Nazis plan to sidestep the causes of past defeats. Instead of exhausting their own strength by holding European nations as captives at the expense of vital Gestapo manpower, they plan to head and dominate a United States of Europe and add the manpower of those nations to their own military divisions. And Mr. Armstrong wrote that in 1956. Mr. Armstrong was also full of crap. The Germans never had, ladies and gentlemen, a hydrogen bomb plant, nor did they have it at Pinamonde, which was their uh, facilities for building the um, V-2 rockets and the research into uh, rocketry and, and uh, their attempts to reach uh, outer space and orbit. That's what went on at Pinamonde. And so then... Secondly, they plan to strike their first blow, not at France or Poland in Europe, but with hydrogen bombs by surprise attack on the centers of American industry. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the Germans never had a hydrogen bomb. We're not working on a hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb theory wasn't even arrived at until well after the close of World War II. It says, yes, this is prophesied. You think all this fantastic? Well, listen, and listen carefully, because these very Nazi plans, which have leaked out from underground, have been published, were known, were, have been published, were known to Almighty God, and recorded by Him in His prophecies 2,500 years ago. You'll find this prophesied in Daniel 2 and 7, and more specifically, in the 17th chapter of Revelation, a United States of Europe, a flash in the pan resurrection of the ancient Roman Holy Roman Empire. I mean, he goes in and tells you what Daniel 2 and 7 are all about in the 17th chapter of Revelation. It's not about these 10 Illuminati, Freemasonry-inspired economic blocks that cover the whole geography of the whole world. And if, we, if we're going to understand the beast and the power of the beast or the abomination that causes desolation, you have to look at prophecy, you have to look at geography. There's a king of the north, there's a king of the south. But, you know, what is a kingdom? You know, a kingdom has a, you know, a king, plus it has subjects, plus it has geography. See, I think sometimes that's too simple for people. He says, it will possess greater military might by far than Rome of old, but it will also inherit fatal weaknesses. Prophecy symbolizes this admixture of never equal military might and unprecedented weakness with the apt phrase, iron mixed with my clay. The European nations will unite militarily, but they are suspicious and envious of each other. They hate one another. And that's the description of Europe today. 
This time the Germans are coming back from defeat faster and more effectively than they did after World War I. The comeback they are making is phenomenal, faster than any other European nation, faster than we think. So while Americans bask lazily in the stultifying sunshine of prosperity, our hearts set on push buttons, shorter hours, less work, more leisure, vacations, and travel, I have seen the swarms of Germans walking briskly, briefcases in hand to their day's work between 5.30 and 6.30 in the mornings, down the streets of Frankfurt, Dusseldorf, and Essen. While our prime objective seems to be idleness, ease, and luxury, the German mind and heart and interest appear set on just one thing, hard, energetic work that will yet put Deutschland uber allies or Germany overall. So incidentally, I'm writing these words on a German-made typewriter. <laughs> he says, because it's better and sounder made machine than any American portable. The American way seems to be not how good, but how cheaply and quickly we can slap things together and how much we can get for it. If American industrial strength beat the Germans twice, present German hard work and industry is assuredly going to beat us unless we wake up to what's actually happening, which we won't. Do you think Mr. Armstrong understood what's happening to America? I think so. I think so. And then again, incidentally, I wonder if you realize that Nazis were working on the hydrogen bomb before the end of World War II. They had it very near completion. That is not true, ladies and gentlemen. The Germans were never working on a hydrogen bomb. They were working toward an attempt to create an atomic bomb, which they never even got close to, not even remotely. The hydrogen bomb theory was arrived at by Dr. Edward Teller in the United States long after World War II was over with. We didn't know then that it was a hydrogen bomb, but we did know the Germans were on the verge of completing some terrifying new weapon, which if perfected in time could have turned apparent defeat at the 11th hour into an unbelievable victory for the Nazis. During the later months of the war, the central theme of my American broadcast was that and he calls it the title, Race Against Time. He said it was only a chance, lucky hit, or was it providential by an American bomber that destroyed this hydrogen development and enabled the Allies to win. German nuclear scientists are the world pioneers in this field. When this United States of Europe ener emerges, they will have the hydrogen bomb and the guided missiles to project it with pinpoint accuracy on every vital American and British production center. Again, ladies and gentlemen, that's a complete and total lie. And the bomb that he was talking about that was dropped on the plant in Germany was on a heavy water plant. It had nothing to do with a hydrogen bomb. And again, Germany was not working on a hydrogen bomb, had no inkling that they could even possibly remotely make a hydrogen bomb. And since they hadn't even come close to perfecting an atomic bomb, did not possess the trigger that is needed to detonate a hydrogen bomb, which is, of course, an atomic bomb. So Mr. Armstrong, the Worldwide Church of God, the Philadelphia Church, and this gentleman, if I use the term loosely, who is giving this little sermon, are full of bullshit. So today the stage is all set. At a certain moment, the new leader of this European combine will appear suddenly in the public eye. He's already behind the scenes in action, but the world does not yet recognize him. He still works undercover. Perhaps this coming military political leader does not yet know how many or precisely which European nations will join in this united Nazi fascist Europe, but you and I can know the number, for God Almighty wrote it down for us 1,900 years ago in Revelation 17. There will be ten dictators exerting iron rule over ten European nations. So there's not going to be ten economic blocks. And it says, these ten will give all their military power to the central overall leader, pictured under the prophetic symbol, the beast. This prophecy does not reveal exactly which ten nations will be included, but this resurrected Roman Empire will bind together some 250 to 300 millions of peoples. That is, more manpower than Russia the United States has. The strong indication of these prophecies, then, is that some of the Balkan nations are going to tear away from behind the Iron Curtain. That's another lie, ladies and gentlemen, for the current population of the United States of America is somewhere around 260 million people. 
and that's already happened. And it says, Russia has lost already to all appearances. He said that in 1956. And that's exactly what happened. So, um, you know, why don't we get back into these kind of books? You know, why, why don't we get into those kind of things? Brethren, you know, God has given us you know, such incredible knowledge and we just need to focus on that and go back and reread it and reread it and reread it and study it and study it and study it. And, study it. and uh, you know, why aren't our booklets dog-eared as maybe some of these other books are? Let's look at Ezekiel 33. I want to close there. Ezekiel 33. And I just think it's kind of an interesting comparison and you can, maybe you can look at these books in this light. There's many principles taught in this book. Ezekiel 33, in verse 1, it says, And again the word of the Eternal came unto me. He says, Son of man, speak to the children of the people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him up for a watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. And so here God is talking about a watchman and what a watchman does. And it says the people can take a man of their people and they can... You know, they can set up a watch. And I think there are many people out there that love to read books by Mr. Kahn, Mr. Cooper, and in some ways, then they set them up as their watchmen, right? I mean, in principle, you know, people can see that this, this country is going down and they're setting up a watchman. But brethren, we have been given a watchman. And do we understand that we've been given a watchman from God? And that's what this chapter is all about. Look at verse 7. It says, So you... O son of man, I have set you a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. You see, some people can choose their own watchman, or what we could do is we could choose God's watchman. And God has given us a watchman, and brethren, that message is there. And we have a very clear message. It's a very simple message. You know, and, and here we have men that say, look, you know, they're men, they're men with a message. Well, Brethren, do we understand that we are men and women with a message? And ours is the only true message. And so whenever we maybe are tempted to go out to a bookstore and we, we see a book with a very exciting title, you know, let's review that book biblically before we buy it. And maybe let's review that book biblically before we get so caught up in it. So that's it for the Bible study then tonight. And that's it for the uh, last half of the broadcast of that tape, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know. Uh, I hope you caught it all because he made some astounding revelations. Jesus Christ is an extraterrestrial and will be coming back to the earth in a UFO. He made that statement just as clear <laughs> as, the, as the day is bright with sunlight. He made the statement that uh, if they serve their God, man will live for all eternity. That was the promise of Satan in the Garden of Eden. He said that they are about becoming gods. Again, the promise of Satan to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He, uh, he made many other statements that they are uh, of the uh, house of David, they're British Israel, they are Israel. Um, um, the United States is Manasseh, and all of this British Israel of baloney. Uh, and I could go on and on and on and on and on. What you heard is a broadcast from the heart of the Illuminati to deceive people into following deception. And it's not just their church, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you right now, all organized religions upon the face of this earth today are leading you into deception. All of them, bar none. If you think that you just lucked out and belong to the only one of thousands of different churches that all claim and believe and say they are right and quote the scripture to prove it, and that you haven't made a mistake, I'm telling you right now, you made the biggest mistake of all. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget, if you know another shortwave station that's looking to broadcast the number one shortwave program in the world with the largest listening audience, let me know, because I want to change broadcasters. I want to change stations. 
And if you know of any AM or FM stations that are interested in carrying this broadcast, it doesn't cost them a penny, have them contact me right away. They can do it by fax at 520-333-4578. That's 520-333-4578. God bless each and every single one of you.